The views and opinions expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of the staff and management of Salem Media of Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Um, actually, I'm really excited about today's show. I won't be doing my usual geeky uh, you know, news and information and education because the, uh, the gentleman that I'll be bringing on in a little bit is um, so informative and so educational when it comes to um, you know, holistic animal common sense health that um, I feel like this is going to be a really good uh, time for you guys to learn about, you know, what options our pets have. I mean, the last show that I had with a veterinarian was very interesting, too, and I feel like our time just went by so quickly that, you know, there was so much information that he could have shared with us. It was unfortunate, but I'll bring Scott Osgood as well back to the show at some point. Um, but you know, the, the difference between these two gentlemen is that, you know, Scott is a board certified veterinarian, um, you know, that you would go to normally. Um, and, uh, Tom, uh, Sandberg is actually a board certified, a naturopathic Adam, pe- uh, pet naturopathic doctor. Well, I wouldn't say doctor. He's a, he's a, um, expert. And so when it comes to your health as a human being, you know, you go to your Western medicine doctor, your internist, and you go to your specialist and all that good stuff, right? When it comes to specifics of your health. And then you also go to a DO or you go to a natural path, you go to a holistic a practitioner, you go to all these different types of doctors and different types of practitioners for specific needs. Well, the same thing with our pets, you know, um, it's so hard to figure out what's wrong with our animals and we don't know how to take care of them when it comes to specific issues, you know, whether it's cancer or whether it's diabetes or whether it's, you know, uh, skin issues, um, you, you're kind of scratching your head going, what do we do to fix this, right? How do we do it? Because we know how to do it with us because we have, you know, we, we speak the same language. We kind of understand what our doctors tell us and our, what our parents would tell us if we were sick as children. But our pets don't know how to tell us, especially if you're a cat owner like I am. Cats are really good at hiding their pain. And, you know, you never know that they're going through something uh, unless, you know, you actually take them to a, a, a visit to their veterinarian yearly and you know, the checkup will prove blood work or you know examination that there is something really going on. Well, you know, personal experience yesterday, I had to take my cat in for a uh, surgery for his mouth. I had no idea that there was a disease which the body fights um, or doesn't protect the uh, integrity of the tooth. And it turns the tooth into cottage cheese. I believe it's called oral uh, resorption disease. And, you know, my poor uh, cat, who was 10 years old, had to have all his canine removed. And, you know, it may not sound like a big deal for us because we go to the dentist, but for an animal, can you imagine they don't know what's going on, why they're being, you know, put into the uh, a surgery uh, room. They don't know why their their tooth is missing when they wake up or why they feel bad. It's just really heart wrenching for the owner and, and for the pet lovers out there. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on with our pets that we don't know about. And and the reason why I'm bringing on Tom Sandberg is because Tom actually has been in the health and wellness industry in the human level for a very, very long time. That's how I know him. But I had no idea 30 years moving forward to today, he's actually gone through some extensive educational background and understanding why our pets get diseases how long do they live and why do they not live as long as they should? Um, so, you know, what his background is, and I've got to give you guys his um, download because he's really done a lot. I'm very impressed with uh, who he is today. Um, Tom is uh, researches, uh, he's a researcher, he's an animal activist, he's an author of Animal Na- uh, uh, Naturopath, and he's board certified by the American Council of Am- uh, Animal Naturopathy and the American Association of Drugless uh, Practitioners. Um, he was actually born in Norway, but he's lived in the U.S. for a very, very long time. And now, currently, he lives in Park City, Utah, and he has two dogs and two cats. So he's not just, you know, someone that goes out there and does the research. He actually is a uh, pet owner, not just one, but four animals, which is great. His background is in biology and chemistry, naturopathy, and is currently studying and testing cellular health, epide- epigenetics, uh, energy healing. And he's actually... Um, 
basically is trying to figure out how to keep their body in homeostasis, you know, keeping that balance. We all have that issue as human beings, right? How do we keep our bodies healthy and, and in balance? It's really hard to understand unless you've done a lot of research like Tom has, how can you bring the animal back into a place of health? And, um, you know, Tom always believed in dogs and cats should live a much longer life. And that's why he's been doing his research. And in his re- research and data, he has also developed several strategies on how we can extend the life of our pets and also how we can lower the risk of cancer and other chronic diseases that are taking over uh, some of our animals. And, you know, with Tom, he has common sense, um, you know, theories. And in these common sense theories, you'd be like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. But how do you apply it? Um, He'll tell us that too. And I think that's really important. So, you know, without um, getting into details, because I'm not the expert in this. I mean, I I wish I was because I think my animal, well, it's not my fault. This is a genetic thing that my cat went through. But there are some things that we can avoid so that our pets don't suffer and that we actually are able to have them for a much longer life. Tom, are you there? Yeah. Oh. I, I had a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're clear. You, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. perfect. Perfect. Well, I just got through telling everybody how um, extensive uh, your background is in understanding our pet's health because of the fact that a lot of our animals are going through health issues um, and we don't understand why. And, and we're going through these, you know, heart wrenching moments as, as pet owners. And we're trying to do our best. And we think we're doing our best because there's a certain amount of information that we get. So I was comparing you to like the DOs and the health practitioners and the wellness experts that are out there that have different um, uh, ideas and strategies and research versus just Western medicine, you know, like our veterinarians who are taking care of our pets with the medical understanding and education that they've had. So there are options for our pets, just like we have options as human beings as to understanding the best possible avenue for our health. So I just wanted you to, just in case you didn't hear that, I, I wanted to update you on that. So uh, welcome right. to the show. Thank you. Yay. Good so to be here. I'm glad to have <laughs> you finally. I mean, I was telling them that I knew you when you were a human fitness, health and wellness person. I had no idea that I know. you had a... Uh, 30 years later that you've gotten to the level of understanding our little fur animals. Um, this is pretty impressive, Tom. Can you tell me a little bit about what your research has, uh, where it's taken you and what you've discovered? Yeah. Let's see where I'm going to start here. Well, I started about in 2000. And the first thing actually was very simple because I've always been into Great Danes. And back in Norway, I'm, I'm originally from Norway, as you know. And uh, and uh, these are the breed I kind of get attached to back in Norway. But I, I got sick of hearing the same thing over and over and over again. But people tell me, oh, I love Great Danes, but they live so short. So I don't think I want one because the, the re- normal lifespan on a Great Dane is in between six and eight years if you live to their 10. So that, of course, is discouraging. And also, if you are into rescue, these, some of these Danes end up being rescued for different reasons. And if they are two or three years, those are really, really hard to rescue because they expect maybe to get two or three years out of a dog that you rescue. And <clears throat> that's, you know, very few want to go into that. So I figured out how can I get these dogs to live longer and um, start studying. And so that's kind of that kick that I all off and uh, I start studying and what could be the reasons for for the short lifespan. But when I came to the United States, I, I noticed a big difference between what we feed in Norway and what we feed, uh, what they fed here in, in the States. And that's when I first noticed all this kibble food and all that. And said, that, that doesn't, this is not what we feed in Norway. Because we fed meats and we bought food from the butcher and things like that. We even fed something called dried fish hmm. that um, the Vikings used. But that's why they could travel so far because they they caught the fish, they hung it up during the winter and right. then dried it out, and that fish lasts forever. Yeah, I mean it can last for years. And what they do, they put it in 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 water, and it sort of comes back and you know become a fish again, not live, of course, but you know something you can eat. Right. So so that's why so they ha- extremely nutritious. So you fed those things too, and. Uh, so when I just noticed the kibble food and 
kind of was not that hard to figure out that it doesn't look like the dog food I'm used to. So starting to research these things, then I then I, when I start getting my own dogs, it was a part when I lived in Hawaii and over there, I didn't have dogs. But when I moved to the mainland after my my part nine years in Hawaii, I, I got a great Dane, and I decided that I would start to see if I can feed this the way I fed in Norway, so start feeding in raw food. Um, I got so much flack from that, and I, I just, everybody thought I was trying to kill my dog. Yeah. And especially when I gave him chicken wings and things like that, I said, okay, that's it. That this starts, you know, you're going to kill your dog with that. But of course, I know I wouldn't. So that's kind of how they started. And then I got another day. So I had two, and I fed those raw, and then saw how much they tried on it. People start kind of getting noticed, and I was on the internet a little bit, not much. And other people got interested and in wanted me to, you know, share what I did. And I started accumulating a, a group of people that fed raw food. And I got up to about 100 people. And I started to kind of ask them to update me and then give me feedback how they were doing and all that. So I did that for about 10 years. And I finished that I saw kind of like a pre-study of 60 dogs that ended up finishing this, this sort of little mini-study I had had going on and uh, they all lived up their time and uh, they most of them lived much longer than the statistics so you can go online and you can google the lifespan of any breed so you, you will get to get an answer there for what's the average lifespan on these different breeds and then surpass those by many years some of them they all like the bigger dogs like giant breeds they almost double the lifespan my dames live into their early to mid-teens, which wow. is almost doubling the lifespan of them. That's so that crazy. was the biggest thing. But but something I never thought of starting out with this was another thing that started coming during these 10 years where I started noticing is the cancer, the rate of cancer, which is now horrific with dogs, about 6 to 7%, I think is even more. Dogs get cancer, and over 10, you know, it's close to probably 80, 90% of dogs get cancer. So it, that was the numbers I got from my study from the 60 dogs that just had one dog with cancer. And I was like, okay, that's a complete fluke. And that doesn't make any sense. But it made sense for me because I know during these 10 years when I did this study, I'd study so much biology or other things when it comes to raw feeding, the, the digestive system of dogs, and all that, because I had fights with people all, all, all during these years about raw feeding, yeah. why I did it, and all those things. I studied it more and more and more. And um, I just got more and more convinced this is the thing. So after that 10 years, so 12, about 12 years, I decided to, to add a 1,000 dogs to the study and continue my study. And uh, after a year or so, I, I decided I want to go to 5,000. And now I'm up to 6,000 dogs that are participating in this study. And the way they set up, they're all raw fed. One way, they're, they're different kind of raw, raw food uh, diets. You can put a dog on. So variations of it, so I accept any any of these because I, you know, I'm not telling exactly what people should feed or not feed, but as long as it's raw, I will take them into my study. Well, are these all different and, types of uh, breeds of dogs, Tom? Oh yeah, yeah, any breed, any age, anything. I'm trying to fight, uh, and they all will. The, the each dog is a case, so each case will live. There's a lifetime study on each case, so uh, I would, to the end, with the end of the life. And they are no longer around, then that's one case. So I'm trying to get thousands of those. My goal is 10,000. That will take many years, but I, I'm probably going to report or publish something around when I have 5,000 cases. I just need a lot of cases to make make the case, right. so to speak. And uh, just if I report now and I've, you know, for you 100 dogs, because most of them are still alive, it would make a big impact. I already see trends that is so. Uh, almost unbelievable in a, in a sense of health and how they're doing. So for me, it's a, I'm encouraged to continue the study as long as I can. I will eventually train others so the study can continue. But um, because I think they will, you know, go past my lifetime. But uh, the more cases I can create, the more convincing it will be. And I can repeat this over and over and over again. And it sort of becomes close to a science study. But... Um, Nobody can do a true 
scientific study on this because that will cost too much to do. Right. And uh, we'd like you know, 30 years with thousands of dollars, and nobody will have any interest in invest that money because most people that invest in studies have some sort of a, you know, and their results going to create some benefit for them. But in this case, uh, you will, the only benefit here will be to the pet owners. There's right. no company or any, any big organization that really would, you know, make any type of profit from a raw feeding study as far as I see now, maybe later. So what I do, I just gathering evidence and then more and more and more and more. And the more I have, the better, the more convincing I'm hoping this study is going to be. So that's so now. I haven't been public with this for maybe started a year ago, a little bit, very carefully. So now I'm more public because I see these trends. So all I do now, I report the trends from my study. So if anybody ask anything, I, I've probably seen it before when it comes to different right. type of experience. conditions. And, yeah. And I also dealt with a lot of dogs with cancer because that is another thing that kind of popped up during this last 20 years. I'm 20 years into it now. And uh, people ask if I can help with cancer because I, I, I see some trends there, too, that's very interesting when it comes to food and cancer. So, Isn't so it funny? You have, have a lot of, you have that theory. If you give yeah. the body what it, it needs, it does what it's supposed to. Uh, my quick question to you is, and, and don't lose your t- a train of thought, if you get somebody uh, an animal that is, let's say, first stage cancer, how quickly... Well, I see. Not, I'm not talking like in a week, but how quickly do you see a change in the chemistry or the biology of the animal after you've put him on this strict diet of raw food? In many cases, you see immediate results. Like you can, it, it, when it comes to the cancer itself, it's difficult depending because they they all in different places. Cancer and organs are very difficult to to reverse a, a tumor on the body can be much easier to, to reverse. And then tumor on the body is not really life-threatening anyway. But but things that I attacked or sitting on an organ and maybe damaged the organ beyond 60 70%, those are really, really hard to do anything about. But it all depends how the immune system responds to the diet. If the immune system really responds well to the diet, it can see some amazing results. There were many cases of cancer and I actually just got rid of it altogether just on by a change of diet. But it, it, every case is different. So I can never tell anyone if they do this, oh, yeah, do it. the dog's going to be cancer-free. I never do that. I can never do it because it doesn't happen. Right. But the, what I see in the dog itself, they see improvements. They see the dog in kind of... Well, let's say they go back maybe two, three years in the appearance of, of the age. They get, get uh, more energetic. The muscle is they're getting muscle. They see or maybe get shinier or thicker and things like that. That that they see almost within a week or two. And Not fully weight, on, right? but but they start seeing changes yeah. in their dog very very quickly, and uh, which is encouraging. And I seeing it definitely a trend that that the dogs with cancer that can switch their wolf food diet, they do extend their life more than the dogs that do not change the diet. I definitely see a trend there, so but um, this, which makes it, total sense. Tom, is, you know, a lot of people that are listening, they're going to probably say, you know, our, our, our doctors or our specialists are saying that it's not safe for these animals to eat raw food because they might get toxins or they might get um, spir- oh, not this, um, salmonella, you know, from the chicken. So, yeah. You know, as human beings, obviously, we can't really eat raw food unless it's seasoned in certain countries. Like we were talking about uh, tartar, you know, the raw meat. Even beef tartar. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, with animals, time, you have a different... First time I... Go no, ahead. I'm so, so ignorant. It, the first time I got it, I, I wow, well, what? You forgot to cook my food. And, you know, I was <laughs> on a date and looked like yeah. a complete moron. <laughs> and then that was back in Norway. I never seen it before. I know. But but uh, no, that's true. That's the main argument, and it makes sense if you don't really know and have any experience with it. But in my opinion, and this is my opinion based on everything coming from my own research, my own data, or nobody else, is that these dogs have no problem with this uh, with their raw food diet or raw meat bought in in a store. Uh, I don't know if you know if you took a took a roadkill that been on the road for like a week or so, and you start feeding that, that might cause some problems. But normally, 
uh, a food from a grocery store doesn't have enough bacteria to 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 do any damage in a dog. And they are right that the, the dogs have cancer because of the compromised immune system. No doubt about that. Also, if dogs are going through chemo, those things, they, they know very well that that compromised immune system too. But the bacteria in this food is no match to a dog. This is my opinion now. Okay. It's no match to a, to a carnivore, which is set up to kind of eat the scavengers too. So in the wild... They will maybe kill something. They could be in the middle of the summer. They don't eat everything. They come back, eat more and more and more. It could be laying around for a week or two and they're full of maggots and all those things. They can still eat it. They won't die from it. They have things set up in their digestive system to handle those type of foods. It starts with the saliva. Saliva have enzymes there that will kill some bacteria. We encapsulate some bacteria. From the mucus system will do that. In the stomach, they have acids that will kill some of the bacteria. Their digestive system is so fast that it's very hard for pathogens and bacteria to colonize and it's anywhere in the intestines. If they do, they, and probably people have experienced that, animals have a, a, a really good method of getting rid of things really fast. Uh, people often call it like cannon butts. That means that they just shoot out everything they don't want in their body and they create <laughs> some a, a, a diarrhea that you've never seen before. Right. So these have, they have different systems to get to handle bacteria, and I I honestly don't see I've never seen a dog get sick from from a raw food diet in the sense that some <clears throat> veterinarian you know kind of say that could happen. So, but that this is my opinion. I'm not saying it didn't ever happen or anything, but in my my opinion. It, it, uh, it, it doesn't happen, and the benefit far, far outweighs any type of risk for, for that. And I mean, it, it, yes, it, it, it sounds terrifying, when, uh, and it makes a lot of sense that it could happen, but um, they even done studies on, on E. coli and, and salmonella studies to see how long they, they last you know, sits in, the, in their poop and they poop and then because of environmental concerns, if people have dogs and they poop in the yard and they wonder how, much, how long the bacteria will sit in, in, you know, live in their poop. So they feed dogs with, that are contaminated with salmonella and, and E. coli and <clears throat> to test this. And there's a study out there, you can just Google it. And the um, interesting part is that they they talk about this study and they come up in the numbers how long this thing sits in the in their poop and it could be dangerous if people touch it and all that. And it's nothing uh, uh, in the very very end. It's a little note there. Saying, oh, by the way, none of the dogs get sick from this meat we fed them. Oh. <laughs> so, so that's sort of like a proof there that you know these are actually injected with the with the bacteria and, and the dogs handle it just fine. But it's like, you know, probably more healthy dog. And there is, yes, right. there, there, is, there is a little concern. And, and but, you know, to me, the, the, the benefit of switching a, a, a dog with a compromise, because the only way they can restore the immune system is to feed the type of food their digestive system was set up to, to, to digest for homeostasis. And that's raw food. They are carnivores. And that's another whole discussion that, you know, there are people out there that don't say, don't think dogs are carnivores anymore. I have not seen any scientific proof that dogs have switched to, to omnivores, which, which you see on most kibble, kibble manufacturer website where they, you know, they, they claim that dogs are carnivores. And I did two, three years ago, I wrote to all of them. Not all of them, but you know, four, five, or six of them. I asked them what the proof is for you know, since they claim that dogs are omnivores. carnivores, not omnivores, and then nobody ever got back to me. Maybe because I they're easy to, to feed. Because you know, we talked about this before. No, of course, dogs of course. are easier to dog feed way. whatever you want, but cats are very specific, and that's the difference. I think cats are so strictly carnivores. I mean, they're just. They're, the way that they are, well, the personality is different from dogs. That's right. And if you could classify with scientific proof that dogs were on the wars, then you pretty much can justify selling what they're selling. You know, that food. But you can't, uh, very hard to justify that food if they agree that dogs are carnivores. But carnivores, per definition, are flesh eaters. They're meat eaters. They hunt and kill and eat that with whatever the animal they kill. 
So that's the definition of a carnivore. And but then they they serve this sort of kibble food, and that's very far from a from a carnivore diet. So right. that's, common that's sense the problem. But nutrition. yeah, but but if they could call them omnivores, then you know they are one step closer to what they are making. And, and can justify it. Well, if you look at the teeth structure, you know, if you look at human beings' mouths, the, it's a different structure in the way that there's less sharp tooth than, than flat tooth. And, and cats, they have very sharp teeth, and so do, so do yeah. dogs. So uh, why do they have those fangs? It's to break up whatever they're killing. And that usually is, yeah. you know, a live um, animal. And so, I mean, I get that. But, you know, I, I God bless the veterinarians and Western medicine because, they, like you said, you're doing the research, so you're understanding the material to a level of uh, depth that, unfortunately, veterinarians do not do this kind of research because most vets don't have the time to do this kind of extensive, time-consuming, a lot of animals to do what you're doing. Because if they did, a lot of them that I spoke to, at least the ones that I go to, because you know the type of person I am, I need somebody with an open mind, is that if I were to su- suggest... You know, this is what I'm going to do to my, for my pet. They don't say, no, Bianca, don't do that. They say, you know, it could and it probably would, but we don't have enough data for it. That's what they say. So that it protects them from saying, you know what? It, it might make a difference, but we're not going to tell you that because we don't have the research to prove to you or to the officials that this is correct. So you're doing the homework for everybody. You're doing the research for everybody. You've even established a, a school, a research uh, a foundation, and an academy so that you're able to put all this data together for everybody to be able to read. And you have a book too, right, online? Yeah, the Beginner's Guide to Raw Feeding for people that are sitting on the fence that are terrified to start a raw food diet and wrote a book for them. So I'm taking them step by step, first two, three, four weeks into a raw food diet, which is uh, much, much easier than anybody thinks it is. And if you read most raw feeding books, you you pretty much get so terrified of doing something wrong that you, you know, half of them would never do it. So, and, and that's a big problem because there are things that um, they're trying to do. The raw, the ones that teach raw feeding, they're trying to do everything at one time or they're trying to make this into some some... Uh, the, the dealing with balance and things like that we can talk about a little later yeah. but uh, it, it's, um, it makes it too complicated for people and they get terrified because they come from kibble and they right. think kibble is balanced and, right. and how long does it t- feed a dog kibble like five seconds three seconds you just right. put it in a bowl you're done right. if you go into raw feeding it takes much longer and right. uh, and you need to put some thought into it but it's still very very simple and the benefits are you know in my opinion, so incredible so it's worth the time it takes to feed them. Tom, we're gonna take a we're gonna take a really quick break, but when I come back, what I'd like to go over, if that's okay, is your um, three steps to creating a healthy pet. That's one, and number two, I'd like us to go over um, maybe some of the the basics of what is a balanced raw food. Uh, diet look like, like, you know, all the ingredients and things like that you would like, so that people get an idea of what that might take. And then so that when they do get a chance to go and take a look at your book, um, it will be registered a little bit because hearing it more than once will help them to understand what this means. So we're going to okay. take a quick 30 seconds, one minute break, and then uh, we'll continue on with, with Tom. Free month of Netflix, free month of Hulu, free month of Honolulu Club. <laughs> what? That's right. Sign up today at Honolulu Club, Hawaii's premier athletic, social, and business networking club. And they'll give you the month of May for free. Honolulu Club offers state-of-the-art fitness services with Honolulu's top trainers and amenities. It's time to get ready to look your best this summer. Log on to HonoluluClub.com or call 585-9626 for more info. Honolulu Club, Hawaii's premier athletic, social, and business networking club. Sign up today. Have you heard of microcurrent therapy? If you suffer from chronic pain, arthritis, sports injuries, ligament injuries, or migraines, the electro equoscope can help. This non-invasive treatment system is drug-free and shows no negative side effects. If you are seeking pain relief and want to boost your immune system, schedule a demonstration or consultation by calling Kelly, your microcurrent electrotoxologist, at 485-9697 or follow on Instagram at Kelly's Time. Make your appointment today. 
And we're back with Tom Sandberg. He's the animal naturopath, and uh, we're discussing raw food diet for our pets and what that looks like and, and how does that help their health and well-being. All right, Tom, so uh, before we went on break, I wanted to kind of finish up that thought of of the, your ebook that you have online and how it is, it is for me, like when I had discussed this with you, it seems like overwhelming because I don't know what I'm supposed to feed them because of these pet foods that are already made for us. It's, I feel like they already balanced the, the, uh, you know, the taurine, which my cat would needs, um, and then the, you know, vitamins and amino acids and other things like that. You know, most people who aren't in the field that we were in with health and nutrition may not understand what those portions look like. So does your book explain those steps? Yeah, it does in a sense because, uh, but but it doesn't uh, probably what you expect. The, the 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 problem here is that when people come from kibble, when you look at the back of a kibble, it it it, it lists all ingredients and a percentage of so recommended daily doses and all those things. So it, it, it appears to be a balanced diet, but the problem is that everybody's different. Every dog is different. Every cat is different. The nutritional requirement for any type of living thing is different and you have a different requirement i have a different requirement so we never know that what is a balanced diet that that nobody really knows that another thing is that the food you feed is different the the, the food you buy somewhere you know in maybe on the east coast or west coast can have different nutritional uh, micronutrients in their values so we don't know that either and there is a <clears throat> pretty agreed upon that the nutritional values in any type of meat, fruit, vegetables, anything we have now is much less than it used to be due to all the fertilizing and other things we do to our soil. So that has it's different too. And when was this created? Who came up with what is balanced? Nobody really knows. When you start digging into it, you don't find any answers to any of this. So this is a, a pretty much a mystery, but it's accepted. Whatever is back on the bag, and they they, they they say this is balanced, everybody think, okay, good, I don't have to figure that out. So then suddenly you start maybe getting introduced to a raw food diet, and then, wait a minute, I don't know anything now, because the, the piece of chicken or the piece of beef, it doesn't have anything written on it, how much is in here of, on anything. So you just sort of think you're just out in this world of completely have no clue what you do and you feed this meat and you have no idea what's going in nutrition wise into this diet and you wonder if you're balancing it and that's the biggest biggest question and concern with people are going to raw feeding but in my opinion they're just thinking about it completely wrong so what you need to do the one the only one let's say you take a dog the only one that know what your dog needs nutrition wise is the dog itself so we have a system inside, or the dog have a system with the cells with sitting there screaming for whatever they need to produce the proteins and whatever other function they need to do in the body. They if they need a nutrient or a vitamin or mineral for that, they will ask the body for it. So we need to just supply the resources for the body to balance itself. So the balance happens from inside. And that's the only one that know how to balance a body. We can't come up with that. We have no chance to figure that out. So the key is to feed a variety of foods that will ensure the body gets what it needs. If we give things that it doesn't need, then the body don't take it. It would either some it will store some for organ reserves for times where they don't get food because they're coming from their past. In the wild, they didn't eat every day. They could go days without food, so they need organ reserves to still function, hunt, and kill. And that will always be a, a reserve for, for around the body where the body would actually <clears throat> look for that and keep that organ reserve. So, But if these are full, the body would just disperse what it doesn't need. So you can never really overdo it by feeding food. It's not like you can get enough for, more than they need or something and get any type of you know, damage from that. So if you can feed, when it, let's say you come to a dog, you feed three, four, five different protein from the from four different meats, four or five different meats. You feed some organ meat, two or three different organ meats, maybe add an egg in there. You are very, very close to have a complete nutritional diet that the body can use and utilize 
and take the nutrients from. Right. So that's how you balance. You don't balance from outside, you balance from inside. And well, that, that makes sense for us human beings too, right? If you eat the same yes, thing every yes, single yes. day, you're not going to get all the nutrients your body needs. You need all the different no. types of greens, different types of colored vegetables, different types of proteins. So you get the different types of amino acids. And I think, um, you know, that makes yep. sense too, because all we're feeding, and this is, this was my mistake too, is I fed my, I fed my cat the same type of dry food for, you know, mm-hmm. almost 10 years. And, um, you know, I've noticed that now he's starting to age. Well, yeah. Why does he have to age? He's only fit in human life. Maybe he's 50 something years old. He's still young, but why is he looking older yeah. and not moving as fast as, or he's hurting more or things are coming up. So now I noticed that. And I should have thought of this sooner because I'm a health person, right? Um, and these are the mistakes I think the average person makes because you think animals are, this is their destiny. They live only this many years and that's it. And they're going to want to, one day they're going to have skin issues. They're going to have, that's normal. But just like us, just like how we exercise, right? Just like how we change our diet mm-hmm. so that we lose weight or gain muscle. Um, we should be doing that with our pets. And like you said, if they eat the right types of food based for their body type, so they're, they're carnivores or, or what have you, depending on mm-hmm. the animal, their body will respond in accordance to the, I guess, the blueprint of their, or their yes. system. So that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, we want to feed a species appropriate diet. So that species and eight species has a diet that is designed for their digestive system. And, and, and that, if you do that, then we get the nutrients it needs and it, and it will stay in homeostasis, which is a balance and everything works beautifully. And that will lower oxidative stress, which is the main cause of aging. So these dogs that for, for very simply said, live longer since they can reduce oxidative stress and stay in homeostasis later, uh, longer. So the moment in my, this is my opinion again, the moment we start feeding these cable type diets and all that, the body never, never have a chance to reach homeostasis. So the, the level of oxidative stress and those things goes, goes, escalate much faster than we'll do in a welfare dog. So they age faster. And, uh, and that's definitely a trend I see. So, so, and that makes sense because if you feed food that the digestive system is designed for, it, it, it has to be better. I mean, it, 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 there's no way around that, 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 that's right. what we need to do, and the same with humans. We just try because we, we we now live in a time where we were never created to live in. I mean, the the the, the we go back to the time, where, however we were created. It doesn't matter how, but the body of us would would, would at that time designed for an environment that's so different from what it is now. Yeah. And when I'm trying to close that gap, I'm trying to figure out what makes the body thrive and what makes it not thrive. And if I can reduce what makes it not thrive and increase what makes it thrive and close that gap, I I I think I can create bodies and, and, and also help dogs and since I don't deal, deal with humans, but it does apply to humans and we can live longer, healthier lives. And so that's that's it's just a gap is too far. Now that that from where we were created back in time, till we be do what we're doing now, it's it's uh, and that's why we don't uh, have dogs that thrive and live longer. Well, they're also domesticated opinion, too, so they're not living in their yeah. natural habitat, right? It's not like they have a backyard that's huge where they can run and hunt and play and and do all these things. Most animals are secluded in an apartment, like mine. Like mine's a small animal, but if you have a bigger dog and you have an apartment, it's not fair because they really, basically, are not living of the quality of life that they also need. Absolutely. So that's a difference too. To mimic, mimic their natural habitat on the natural environment. If you can yeah. closely can get to that, the healthier your dog is, and and that brings up to those three things I right. I believe is most important to to extend the life of your pets and reduce the risk of chronic diseases, one being cancer, and that is feeding the food these dogs or cats are meant for, which in my opinion is a raw food diet. Then tons of exercise, not tons of, but lot. Enough, plenty yeah. of excess more than people think exercise is extremely important to remove toxins or chemicals because they activate the lymphatic system right. which is the garbage collector and the one that gets rid of toxin and chemicals which is, is produced all the time in the body and we need to get rid of that and then since it doesn't have a pump like the cardiovascular system has the heart to pump things around the lymphatic system doesn't have that it, it, it works by movement and that's why exercise is so important then 
The third is the limit exposed to the toxins and chemicals. And that includes, and this is a big, big, you know, controversial thing that includes vaccines. So we need to limit the, 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 the practice of, of vaccinate, uh, vac- vaccinate dogs is just, uh, in my opinion, my opinion, I have to say that over and over again. Yeah, of course. completely out of, out of control. It, it doesn't make any sense that you can vaccinate humans and they last a lifetime. And we keep vaccinating dogs every single year. And it doesn't last a lifetime, in their opinion. In my opinion, it does. It's the same thing. There's no difference in vaccinating a dog and a human. It will last a lifetime. It will be in the body. The antibodies are there for for the for the lifetime of the pet. And and, and many, you know, of course, doesn't agree with me. They're on, especially veterinarian. Then they're not very agreeable to this. I want to just mention something about veterinarian because it seems like I'm totally against them. But oh, there are, so. there is a friend, no, no, a friend, of, no, they are the most valuable people come to any type of emergency care, anything, you know, something happens to your pet, doesn't matter. If you get sick, you need to bring it to the veterinarian because they are the best at diagnosis. Right. And we need to know what's going on with pets. So we need them. It's not that we don't need them. But there are now more and more veterinarians that buy into this. Uh, this type of, of uh, diets, and there is a friend of mine, he's a veterinarian in UK, and he's the head of an organization of about 200 veterinarians worldwide that are subscribing to raw food diets and do that in their practice and use it daily and recommend it. So that is growing. So it is not like every veterinarian does nobody, but they all had to educate themselves beyond what they learn at their, you know, different schools and, and the education they normally take for becoming a veterinarian is, is not there. They had to go beyond that, outside that and study. So it is growing. And um, my veterinarian here in, in Utah, where I live, is also feeding a raw food diet. And she she's um, seeing the benefits of it. So she's totally on board with it. So the, it, it is changing, definitely changing. And it takes time, right? It's the evolution of, of health, just like everything else, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So, you know, people, you know, want things. Don't forget, too. I mean, the traditional way that we feed, and I got to admit, admit this, too. When you feed kibble, it's convenient for me absolutely. because absolutely. I can leave it out all day and my pet can eat it whenever they want, if they want to. Um, but when you feed raw food, it's time uh, consuming to, and, and not a long time consuming. You have to plan it out a little bit, and then you feed yep. them, and then it's done. They don't, there's no, yep. you know, little bit here, a little bit there. So it is. There's a difference in that sense too. Um, so I'll, some people may not do it just because of the convenience factor, but for someone like me, in the way that I think, you know, I really love my pets so much that I don't want to ha- hurt them, and I'm trying to think of ways to take care of them in the best possible because they're under my care you know they're under my control and i feel like if i don't do this it's like me taking uh this this is life consciousness this is a live animal you know this you can't just Mm -hmm. throw it in the room and say okay thanks for being a part of my family um this is what you're going to eat and you're going to sleep no exercise i can't do that and most people can't so i'm just i you know for you to be on the show it's to give people options to know that there is another way so if people are dealing with pets who have cancer or diabetes or things like that and they're doing the traditional food source you know this may be something you you need to do your homework with and um you know we're not saying you have to do this but you know tom's giving you guys an option to look at his website um and to take a look at some of the information he has in his book um regarding raw food um but i think when it comes to understanding the details of it, you know, I think most vets probably won't agree to this, like you said initially, but maybe through, maybe the, in the next 10 years, they might say, no, raw food's the oh, way yeah. to go. <laughs> well, right? it, and even some combination of things, and I also see now therapies that could be, I see some great results with low, uh, talking about cancer for a second, uh, uh, low grade, um, um, radiation or even uh, other type of cancer treatments that that combine with raw food, combined with some supplements and things, can have really good results. 
if somebody elected to do a surgery, if they get on a raw food diet after the surgery, I see really good results with that, that the cancer is not coming back. So there are things that can be combined here. It's not like this all out and, and the, what, the, what the veterinarians practice. There is a way of combining these things, but I, I, when it comes to any type of boosting an immune system, I don't see any other way to do it than, uh, from my experience, than switching to a raw food diet. I know it sounds kind of drastic, but that just, just talking about the experience I have over the last 20 years. Well, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, <clears throat> an interesting uh, topic when it comes to um, options of how to feed our animals. Well, it's also a, a challenge how to feed our, our, our humans. <laughs> So, I yeah. mean, I don't, I don't, it's just a big, this is a really complicated, it can be a complicated topic because we've been battling what's the right diet. There is a, con- there is a carnivore diet um, out there for humans. There is the ketogenic yes. diet. There is the paleo diet. There's a Mediterranean diet. So, you know, people are trying to figure out what is, if they can't even figure out for themselves, how are they going to figure out for their, their pets? And this is a big, this is a big conversation. So, you know, I don't think this conversation that we're having today is really enough, Tom. You're probably going to have to come back on and, um, you know, figure this <laughs> yeah, out again. Sure. Cause again, re- repetition is necessary for us to understand. And if hearing it once, they're going to be like, Oh, I, I did hear about this raw food thing, but I don't know what that is. So what I would mi- probably say is we'll bring you back on again and have uh, this conversation. Um, because I think most people are going to want to know again. But besides your, your website, work, which is longlivingpets.com, where can they go to do the kind of research, if they're like us, where can they go to, to look up where it's a, a good online page? Um, I, you can research thing, and this is the crazy part, not crazy part, but the, what makes confusing. If you start looking into raw food diets and start Googling it and all that, you find all kinds of opinions, all kinds of, you know, diet that people think they is the best one. And, and, I mean, it's almost, you, I, I encourage people to do it because we, if you, if you go the way and where you start studying the digestive system of, of animals like dogs and cats, if you really take time to do that, there is no way you won't switch to a raw food diet when you start understanding that. That it's just impossible not to do it, in my opinion. If you fully understand how that digestive system works, and that would be one way. But the reason there are many, many raw feeding groups online, there are many places that they talk about raw feeding and um, and, and t- different types of diets. And you mentioned that even the same type of diets now with dogs, the ketogenic diets and dog for dogs too. They have bars diets, which call mixing raw and vegetables and things like that. There are full vegan diets, which I'm not going to mention anything about. But there <laughs> are the opposite. many of this. No, I don't want to. Yeah. Probably not hard to figure out the opinion about that since I believe <laughs> dogs are carnivores and meat eaters. So, so that, it, it can be confusing. But I promise it's not difficult. You can actually feed a dog. If you're switching a dog from cable to roll, you can feed one meat group and easy for two, three weeks, a month or two, and still benefit tremendously from, from it. So it's, it's an eat. You don't have to think about mixing all these type of foods right away. You just do one meat group at a time and you slowly add other things. Still, the dog's going to have tremendous benefits compared to the cable diet, in my opinion. And I've seen it over and over and over again. Well, the, when, so you to, it, when you it, told it, me this, you cannot go wrong. You no, you can't. You can't. The only thing you can go wrong is you would do something very, very long term, like for years, and you know, six months. You maybe just feed one thing and nothing else. That that eventually going to not benefit your dog very much. But you would very few people ever do that. I don't know anybody has done that. So, but to get started is always that step into raw feeding that's terrifying. What am I doing? What am I going to feed? And my dog's going to survive. He's going to be alive tomorrow. <laughs> and it, they all survive. They all, they, but the good thing, and that works for 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 any type of this. When you switch a role, the benefit you see the benefits so quickly. You just see the poop the same day, almost or the day after. It's right. much less, which can be terrifying because they wonder if everything came out. But the poop of a raw fed dog is much smaller because of the water, the content. That's seventy percent water in in the raw food, so that goes to the body. So then much more comes out. So that's a big difference. But that's a little scary in the beginning before they fully understand it. With kibble, the body, the kibble actually takes water from the body so the poop is bigger. What comes in goes in and comes out. It's different. That way it's the opposite. 
Well, I think consider I mean, a, I consider kibble like as if when you over when you cook vegetables, you take the nutrients out of the vegetables, right? When you overcook yeah, it, especially same with, kibble. Same with the kibble. Yeah, so with, that's why I think yeah. um, it's it's look it's convenient, but at the same time, it's not nutritious or balanced in the sense you think because you just completely they cooked the heck out of the uh, the nutrients from from the food. That's the problem. Yeah, that's the main problem. Then then the nutrients in kibble is killed by the cooking two or three times, and then they add nutrients back because they know that and the, but right. the nutrients they add back is synthetic right so now you have synthetic vitamins which is foreign to a carnivore right. they don't really know what is the synthetic vitamin so they don't handle those and process those very well either right. so so the, and enzymes there's no enzymes that are being added in and all the enzymes in in the kibble is gone that that disappears on a kind of a very low heat that's why just heating the raw food can kill some enzymes already. So, right. so it, it's other things. Yeah, we can talk about that another time. But um, the main problem with kibble is the nutritional value and also the protein that has probably been altered by cooking. So the amino acid is often linked, linked that can be a link for to be utilized by the body to build uh, proteins and other things that need the, these amino acids for. So it's a lot of things that goes on in that kibble that the carnivore doesn't. Well, benefit very much from so well it's definitely something to think about and it's definitely um you know some homework that you've given us to do when it comes to understanding health and nutrition for our pets but i think uh um, you know we still have a bit ways to go when it comes to understanding all of this um you know all of the people out there that do raw food already they're like this is a no-brainer but you know for all of us uh who are used to doing the other version uh, you know, it's a it's yeah. a it's a lifestyle change uh, in our minds and understanding that our Absolutely. just because we're not eat, just because we're grossed out about eating a raw food doesn't mean our animals think it that way. And also, guys, too, your liver processes food, right? So if it doesn't yeah. recognize what is being put into the body, it gets stored as fat, and then your pets have an obese issue. Now, now they're they're fat because their their liver isn't processing the food as energy; it's being processed as storage. So that's another uh, an avenue that we can go to when it comes to um, you know health and nu- nutrition for our pets and their their weight. Yeah. But I think you were saying too when you and I talked before. You put a, a pet into a raw food diet, they lose weight immediately. Like they basically get they get extra weight off of them uh, without much effort because of the fact that their body is now recognizing what they're eating. Yeah, you're working through that. We, we all have a set point, you know, what, what's the ideal sort of like balance point. And in that set point is also the uh, weight, the ideal weight for the animal. And they can much easier achieve that on a raw food diet because they're the immune system and, and uh, working with the body. And, uh, you know, everybody's talking to each other inside the body to say it very simple. So so the body works towards balance and balance also includes uh, uh, an ideal weight. So we all have sort of like an ideal weight that the body strives to be at and it will achieve that if you feed the right food. Right. So Tom... When, when we don't, that's when we get obese when we don't do that. You yeah, know, it, or too skinny. Us yeah. too, us humans too. So look, we ran out of time again, and it's like yeah. you know, you and I talked about this. And we might run out of time, and we did. So your yeah. website is uh, what was that again? So that people can reach out to you if they well, need my to. My research, my research site is longlivingpets.com. My 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 animal naturopath site is theanimalnaturopath.com. Okay. And that's where I help and consult and do things like that. And uh, if people want to join my study, with uh, a feeding role and join my study, I consult these people for free and I help them out and all that. So because they gain, I gain uh, uh, important information from Absolutely. them. So that's the exchange. But if they want to do any type of other consultant, then go to theanimalnaturopath.com. That's when I do my other Perfect. type of consulting and other things. So. Perfect. Thank you, Tom, for coming on my show. I appreciate your knowledge and your wisdom on, on our fur babies. At uh, least no. we have something now. <laughs> well, what I hope people do is give traits and curiosity so they go and study for themselves. You know, go online, start studying this thing, grow food diet, carnivores, all that thing. That's all I would, you know, if I accomplish something like that, then 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 I'm happy. I don't want people to take my word for it, you know, believe me and then go and right. do it. I want right. them to feel it and, and know it and feel like this sure. is right for me but that can all be done by their own research. You guys heard that. You have to do your homework again. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah. 
Thanks, Tom. I appreciate your time. And everyone, if you need to reach out to me, I'm at BeFit4Health.com, BeFit4Health.com. And if you want to reach through to me through to get to Tom, too, just in case, you can do that as well on the contact page. I'll get back to you guys as soon as uh, I can. So wish you guys good health. Uh, stay healthy and be happy. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for joining me.